You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday the 29th of June 2013. Britain's £1.3 billion Ethiopian foreign aid supports forced relocations. Scotland, every child to have state guardian from birth. Pakistani lesbians wed in UK to claim asylum. Germany renews support for Syrian rebels. IMF head Christian Lagarde in court charged with embezzlement and fraud. Dutch anxiety over Sharia Triangle police no-go area in The Hague. U.S. trade deal at risk should Britain leave EU. Islam taking over, Europe soon to be unrecognisable. Syria chemical weapons, war drums beating. Thought for the day, are we all singing from the same hymn sheet at last? And finally, Hitler's kettle. UK News Britain's £1.3 billion Ethiopian foreign aid supports forced relocations. An Ethiopian, known only as Mr O to protect his identity, is suing the Department of International Development, DFID, saying that its foreign aid breached its own human rights policies. The Ethiopian regime, led by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, is forcibly removing people from their homelands and the land is being sold to foreign investors or given to Ethiopians supporting the government. The relocations are often accompanied by death, rape and mutilations. Four million people are being forced from their homes in the west and south of the country, areas that are opposed to the northern-led government. These areas include Ethiopia's Gambella region, a region of rich and fertile farmland overlaying thick seams of gold. It's an area that has been farmed and its rivers panned for gold for generations, stretching back centuries. The Gambella is a stark contrast to deserts and starvation we see on television, and it is being destroyed with the help of British foreign aid. British foreign aid to Ethiopia between 2010 and 2015 will be a staggering £1.3 billion. Scotland, every child have a state guardian from birth. Every child in Scotland is to be assigned a state minder from birth under draconian new proposals that would enable the government to spy on families under the justification of preventing child abuse. The programme is a statutory initiative built into the Children and Young People's Bill. Children's Minister Eileen Campbell justified the proposal by asserting it would make sure there is someone having an overview of what is happening to that child to make sure that early indicators of anything that would pose a threat or risk to that child are flagged up. Writing in The Scotsman of how he penned a dystopian novel based around this very scenario of every child being assigned a government mentor, sociology and criminology lecturer at the University of Abate Dundee, Stuart Walton, writes, Unfortunately, this dystopian future has arrived a little faster than I imagined, as last week the Scottish government's plan to give every child a state guardian from birth was launched. This state-appointed overseer will be a specific named individual and every child will have one from birth. The responsibility for creating the named guardian will fall on the heads of the health boards for the first five years of a child's life, before being transferred to councils. Walton speculates on what kind of behaviour could eventually be deemed child abuse, including the contents of a child's school lunchbox or redefinition of bullying to include a parent shouting at their kid. Pakistani lesbians wed in UK to claim asylum. Rahana Kausa, 34, and Sabaya Kamar, 29, made history when they tied the knot in a register office civil ceremony, then immediately applied for political asylum after they were wed, claiming their lives would be in danger if they returned to their native country, Pakistan. World Date says... These former students, likely coming to the end of their student visas, have found the perfect way to stay in the UK. I think UK stands for utmost kidders, not United Kingdom. Deport them. European news. Germany renews support for Syrian rebels. 
the German government will be renewing and stepping up its support for the Syrian rebels in the fight against President Bashar al-Assad, according to a report in Der Spiegel magazine due to be published on Monday. Angela Merkel's government is preparing to send medical supplies and several hundred bulletproof vests to the rebel fighters of the Free Syrian Army, said the magazine. The German Federal Intelligence Service, BND, is set to resume deliveries of emergency supplies, so-called medipacks, to the FSA, just months after a veto by the German Foreign Office forced them to stop, wrote the magazine. Germany is now in final negotiations with the rebels to organise deliveries of the supplies and hopes to get in exchange information on the military situation in Syria. Germany will not, however, go as far as the UK and France, which have recently indicated they wish to help arm the rebels with weapons. IMF head Christian Lagarde in court charged with embezzlement and fraud. The head of the International Monetary Fund arrived in the dock of a Paris courtroom today as she braced herself to be formally charged with embezzlement and fraud. The clearly nervous 57-year-old said nothing to reporters as she entered the Court of Justice of the Republic, a special tribunal set up to judge the conduct of France's governmental ministers shortly after 8.30am. Lagarde faces a maximum sentence of 10 years in jail if found guilty of the very serious charges. It was when she was President Nicolas Sarkozy's finance minister that she is said to have authorised a £270 million payout to one of his prominent supporters, so abusing her government position. The money went to Bernard Tapie, a convicted football match fixer and tax dodger who supported Lagarde and Sarkozy's oomph, UMP party. World of Date states, whoops. Dutch anxiety over Sharia Triangle police no-go area in The Hague. There have been calls for an urgent debate in the Dutch Parliament about the integration of Muslim immigrants amid claims that one area of The Hague, known locally as the Sharia Triangle, is being run by a form of unofficial Sharia police. The claims relate to the district of Shielderswick, about two kilometres from the city centre, where an almost entirely Muslim population of some 5,000 people surrounds the El Islam Mosque, fueling criticism that the government has failed to ensure a proper ethnic mix in schools and local housing. One recent investigation in which local people were extensively interviewed concluded that Shielderswick had become Orthodox Muslim territory, which was now largely ignored by the city authorities, by politicians and even by the police, on the grounds that it had become self-regulating. The investigation found that Orthodox Muslims had become so dominant that they were dictating what people in the neighbourhood wore and how they behaved. In the case of women, dress was a particular issue. One woman told how her daughter had been approached and told her short skirt was inappropriate while her son had been called a kafir, a racist term formerly used in colonial South Africa to refer to a black person for smoking. Another man said he felt he was gradually being driven out of his home because he had a dog, and many traditional Muslims tended not to keep or favour dogs. Last Tuesday, Social Affairs Minister Ludwig Asher and Freedom Party leader Gert Wilders paid separate visits to the area and are to report to Parliament. Local police chief Mikel de Roos said, We have no indications there is a former Sharia police there. That is not to say it doesn't happen, but we are not aware of it. World Today said, You bet they will remain unaware of it to save face. I thought the term kafar was a Muslim term for unbeliever, not the kafirs used in South Africa, or perhaps, as it is in Holland, it might be linked to the Dutch Boers. World News US trade deal at risk should Britain leave EU. The Obama administration has warned British officials that if the UK leaves Europe, it will exclude itself from the US-EU trade and investment partnership potentially worth hundreds of billions of pounds a year, and that it was very unlikely that Washington would make a separate deal with Britain. The warning comes in the wake of David Cameron's visit to Washington, which was primarily intended as a joint promotion of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership with Barack Obama, which the Prime Minister said could bring £10 billion a year to the UK alone, but which was overshadowed by a cabinet rebellion back in London. The threat by Cameron's ministers to back a UK exit in a referendum on the EU raised doubts in Washington on whether Britain would still be part of the deal once it had been negotiated. World Date states, OK, then the US can take all the immigrants we have from the EU zones and those in the future and we will leave the EU. There is something for nothing. I'm sure Obama will approve of that one. 
Maybe even one of his relatives will be amongst them. Islam taking over, Europe soon to be unrecognisable. The murder of a soldier in London, the stabbing of a soldier in Paris and the violent outbreak in Sweden, Europe's alarm clock has been ringing once again over the past week. The negative birth rate compared to the increase in Muslims, the heavy unemployment and the social religious isolation of European immigrants are all back on the agenda. Europe has lost its will to live as Europe, said Mideast expert Dr Mordecai Kedar to Ynet. It's gathered into museums, into history. If the leaders will not put an end to immigration, we will soon be hearing the death throes of the continent as we know it. If they wanted to integrate within the society as European leaders had hoped, this wouldn't be an issue, said Kedar. But since they want to keep their identities and change Europe, it's obviously a big issue. Every year more Muslims than non-Muslims are born in France. Japan has no Muslims because they don't allow them in. Racism? Maybe. Superiority? Maybe. They don't care. They want to sustain Japan and are looking down on everyone. How long will Europe contain the situation? Good question, said Liebman. After World War II, Europe is extra careful about anything that has to do with human rights and right to freedom. On the other hand, it absorbs aliens that do not integrate within the community. Syria chemical weapons, war drums beating. The news headlines from our researchers' Google alert for Tuesday the 28th of May 2013 tell the full story or lack thereof. From the UK we have Syria increases use of chemical weapons on rebels, France more Syria chemical weapons use signs emerging, Bashar al-Assad's forces accused of new chemical weapons attacks, Syria medics treat hundreds of rebels for symptoms of chemical exposure. Our European allies contribute, chemical weapons in Syria is their proof, renewed fears of chemical weapons being used in Syria, Syrian forces using chemical weapons near Damascus, Mounting suspicions, chemical weapons used in Syria, French FM. Syrian army uses chemical weapons against the rebels. Then the Americans go all out with our love affair with chemical weapons. France says more signs of chemical weapons in Syria. French journalists report chemical weapons used near Damascus. Syrian rebels told John McCann about Assad's chemical weapons use. French foreign minister says more signs have emerged of chemical weapons. France's daily Le Monde. Syrian regime used chemical weapons, while the rest of the world chimes in. First-hand accounts that Assad forces using chemical weapons published. Testing suspected chemical weapons used by Syrian government, France. France says consulting partners over Syrian chemical weapons. Use of chemical weapons in Syria arouses concern, report. Syria fighting rages amidst reports of chemical attacks. French claimed Damascus using chemical weapons against rebels. But the South Africans and Danes reserve judgment with chemical weapons used in Syrian war and Denmark promotes UN efforts at preventing use of biological weapons. Thought for the day. Are we all singing from the same hymn sheet at last? Well, I never would have thought it, but most, if not all, the journalists who have gone into print since the Lee Rigby murder are saying exactly what the British National Party have been saying for many years. It's the fault of successive governments, all as bad as one another, who have been encouraging immigration and the multicultural society as a norm, who are now putting their own citizens in danger, especially in highly enriched areas. All this prattle on about seeing the Muslim communities are not threatened and laying the blame elsewhere simply isn't fooling the great British public any more. The television media, most of all, are using delaying and deflection tactics to save their lives and their faces. I have never seen so much done for so little in all my life. They are showing long clips of Nigeria, that place of which my second husband, now deceased, said, if God wanted to give the world an enema, he'd put the end in Nigeria. And he was a frequent visitor there in the 70s, before the wars and the Muslims took over. It was just corruption everywhere and girls on the streets riddled with HIV. Lovely. They're actually going to the trouble of tracing the murderers. Note, I said murderers, not suspects, relations. What I want to know is that if Nigeria wasn't safe for one or both of these Islamic retards, why are their relations still there? Indeed, why are these two over here? 
That large question hangs over the head of our now defunct multicultural hellhole of a capital city. Just why have our governments let so many of these people into the country in the first place? We have no cultural bonds with Nigeria, or indeed large parts of Africa in general. We, the Brits, were chucked out, remember? So why take in a people who didn't want us there in the first place? Are they addicted to a British way of life? I don't think so, do you? They may be Christian, I really don't care. I also don't care if some have married white girls or class themselves as having integrated, because it won't last long. In the case of Adi Bolajo, who converted, then his, when his brother-in-law was interviewed, Miner's head on TV, now I know what you're thinking, but it was not showing his face, it hadn't been chopped off. He appeared to have white hands and Muslim garb. So I'm a bit lost here. The fact being that Muslims, whether high or low, black or white, simply don't integrate. It's against their religion and their culture, which is much the same thing. This, however, doesn't stop them claiming large amounts of benefits and still spitting in our faces metaphorically. The BBC giving rein to hands off my benefits chowdhury in a ghastly attempt to placate the Muslim communities, or rather to distance them from one of their own, actually provided him to chauffeur-driven services and treated him like a celeb. Even a well-known journalist, Quentin Lett, saw this as a cowardly and despicable act when one of our own had been so brutally dispatched a short time before. The BBC, who consistently and regularly hide the facts of Muslim grooming of underage girls, brought this creature into the limelight to do what? Even Vazi, another creature of the night, has said that she deplored the promotion of extremist nutters and idiots, but on that one I have another thought. Camoran has also said or intimated that he will form a probably large and expensive job for PALS committee, which will look into extremism and radicalism forces, alias Turfor. We already have, and much use is it, Cobra. Now is it me? Am I the only one who cannot see where this is leading? If you think it will provide a coherent and just system to catch and monitor Muslim jihadists in this country, you should have another look and read the title. It reads Extremists. Now either I'm suffering a severe bout of paranoia here, but extremists applies to us, nationalists as well. We are considered extremists, both by the establishment, the government, and to some part, the general public. So don't go thinking that this newbie turf war is solely for Muslims, it isn't. This new so-called committee and the laws it might pass will sentence nationalism to death in this country as well. They'll be looking into extremist sites, and this will cover nationalistically minded websites as well as the myriad of terrible anti-Christian and anti-British sites that have been functioning very well, thank you, up to now, and probably will survive this new initiative. Why? Because of the Human Rights Act that a British government adopted into our laws. Put that with the race card and the we help anyone who isn't white English card, and you have a committee which, if it applies itself to the job it has apparently been set up for, will violate all those laws. But if it hones in on the nationalist brigades, that will be OK. It's been open season on nationalists for the last 20 years and getting worse. Even in the daylight of an obviously anti-white and anti-Christian murder or butchery in broad daylight in our capital city. TV are bending over backwards to deflect the truth about this crime in particular and the general crimes of the Muslim faith all over the world. Paul Lee's murder is highlighted as a one-off and the suspects, as they are called, are merely receptacles of both the web and a couple of Muslim clerics. Their respective and distant relatives are all shocked, and even a neighbour in that mixed neighbourhood knew he, Adi Bolaja, had found Islam, or rather Islam had picked him up like a dog turd from the gutter. All efforts are being made to show the white residents of Woolwich, of which they're on an awful lot, laying the usual carpet of flowers near the spot where he was run over and then hacked to death. It's a great pity that all those who are pictured crying and laying flowers weren't there to stop this terrible crime, instead of hiding behind their cameras, mobile phones and curtains. Too little and too bloody late. One of the murderers has left hospital and been re-arrested, wait for it, for the attempted murder of a woman PC. Am I going slightly bonkers here? Yup, you heard it right. 
Just as I said, these two black bastards are going to get away with it. They'll get a sentence of a few years, during which they'll be fated in their own Muslim communities in prison, probably write a bloody book, and be out within ten years for good behaviour. Whilst the baby Lee's widow is carrying, we'll never know its father, and hopefully not his horrific death until much older. The very sad fact remains that the British media are all doing a moon dance and appearing to be running towards justice, when in reality they're all backtracking as fast as they can. The only things highlighted are the rather superfluous facts around this murder. That is, the murderer's relations and their thoughts, the sort of man Lee Rigby was and how his family are suffering, the so-called neighbours and their coming to terms with this act, the witnesses who haven't really been mentioned at all in the context of being witnesses, and the heavily guarded mosques in all areas and regions of our country, in case we Brits get it into our heads that it really was a couple of Muslims who are suspects in this murder. All deflections at best, all noise and hype to bring the public eye away from the basic factors of this crime and the others, that will surely follow. It doesn't matter, this deflection, because facts are facts, and this little bit of history was sent to me last week, just to highlight to illustrate how a certain religion doesn't integrate. It colonises. But unlike European colonisers, awful though they might have been painted, Islam, once attained in a country or people, simply stops right there back 800 years ago, both culturally, socially and religiously. There is literally no movement forward. In short, a third world society or a democracy pulled back into the Dark Ages. And I quote, In 1968, Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed by a Muslim male. In 1972, at the Munich Olympics, athletes were kidnapped and massacred by Muslim males. In 1972, a Pan Am 747 was hijacked and eventually diverted to an Arab country where a fuse was lit on final approach and it was blown up shortly after landing by Muslim males. In 1973, a Pan Am 707 was destroyed in Rome with 33 people killed when it was attacked with grenades by Muslim males. In 1979, the US Embassy in Iran was taken over by Muslim males. During the 1980s, a number of Americans were kidnapped in Lebanon by Muslim males. In 1983, the US Marine Barracks in Beirut was blown up by Muslim males. In 1985, the cruise ship Akil Loro was hijacked and a 70-year-old American passenger was murdered and thrown overboard in his wheelchair by Muslim males. In 1985, TWA Flight 847 was hijacked in Athens and a US Navy diver trying to rescue passengers was murdered by Muslim males. In 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 was bombed by Muslim males. In 1993, the World Trade Center was bombed the first time by Muslim males. In 1998, the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were bombed by Muslim males. On 9-11-01, four airliners were hijacked, two were used as missiles to take down the World Trade Centers, and of the remaining two, one crashed into the US Pentagon and the other was diverted and crashed by the passengers. Thousands of people were killed by Muslim males. In 2002, the United States and Canada and others fought a war in Afghanistan against Muslim males. In 2002, reporter Daniel Pearl was kidnapped and beheaded by, you guessed it, Muslim males. In 2012, the US concert in Benghazi, Muslim males. 2013, Boston Marathon bombers, Muslim males. 2013, VIA rail bombing thwarted, Muslim males. And now we can add the UK to this unfinished list of killers and killings in the form of Private Lee Rigby in Woolwich, previously a London borough, now a very enriched franchise. All the politicians, all the media and all the establishment can witter on all they like about the extreme right jumping on this bandwagon, but it won't take away the bitter pill that they will have to swallow soon. We nationalists have been running this bandwagon for many years and we're used to its pace and the general lack of honesty that follows this particular bandwagon, which will have to be faced up to soon, especially by all the ostriches with their bums in the air and their heads in the sand. They're even bringing in MI5 or 6 having approached one of the murderers, so no doubt it'll be their fault in the end, MI5 that is. This murder and many other murders, rapes, beatings and crimes would not have occurred had England not been on the receiving end of massive and unchecked immigration for the last 50 years. We would not have the plentiful mosques which would have to be guarded at great cost to the taxpayers. We would not have our education systems overrun with foreign children. 
We might have some remains of the old high streets left. We might have churches better attended and the church bells rung as of old. We might view an English channel solely manned by English staff on TV, as would our soaps and plays. We would have crime and the poor, but they would be our criminals and our poor. We wouldn't have entire streets and towns in which the English can't go, or have fled. We could pay off our national debt if the £12 billion foreign aid policy didn't bribe people to come into this country on the promise of yet more money. Our drugs and alcohol problems wouldn't become endemic because of the resulting lack of jobs, prospects and pride from just too much immigration. Our socialists would not have had the immigration drum to beat us all over the head with, as have Labour, student unions and government workers. Our young females would not have been prey to Muslim groomers for the last 30 years, and we would not be in debt as a country paying for all the extra services and public services that have a massive amount of foreign speakers in this country. In short, although not all these things lie at the door of the Muslim communities, a hell of a lot can and do. And the proof of the pudding lies in the fact that if these two murderers were not Muslim and had not been seen in broad daylight unashamedly hacking their way to fame, yelling Allahu Akbar, this government and our media would not be taking the trouble to waylay and deflect any thought of Islam being behind this so vehemently and thoroughly. Methinks the lady doth protest too much, I believe is the saying here. We should withdraw our troops from Afghanistan, as I believe we're doing at some stage, and deport our Muslim population before real trouble looms on the horizon. Because although it pains me to say so, there are some people and some religions in the world who don't fit in, integrate or merge with the existing peoples in the countries they seem to want to go to, as opposed to staying in their own countries. And furthermore, countries which they cannot in all honesty say are overrun by Christian Europeans as indeed we will be overrun by Muslim hordes in a few years' time. As Churchill said, some Muslims have individually sterling qualities, yup, probably, but we must remember that they are Muslims, and we are Christians or Jews or non-Muslims, and are therefore not accepted into their communities. We are unclean, and this is the basis of their persecution of us in this country. They don't want to mix with us or integrate with us, and why should they? They, like the millions of non-English speakers who pour into this country, seek their own kind, as we would if we colonised any more. Even going abroad, most English seek another Englishman or English person. It's human and it's nature. It is also in our Bible. Each shall seek his own kind. The Muslims are merely doing what we would do. But it is a double-edged sword which has been handed to them by us for voting in the parties who have encouraged immigration and multiculturalism. Our countrymen have never accepted that because we are a generally irreligious people from pagan beginnings, that an entire race, or fact many entire races, can find their lives and operate on a completely hive mentality from a so-called prophet of nearly a thousand years ago. I have news for the media and TV. Muslims are in this country now. They have occupied many towns and cities. They are all shades of the ethnic mix and they will kill if they feel they have to. We Europeans have given them this right that we have denied ourselves and we will have to take it back, legally or illegally. Lee Rigby may well be buried soon, but in calling his death not proven is an insult not only to the public but to his widow and family. Running over, stabbing and trying to cut off his head is a fact and another fact being covered up is that the fact that these beasts who did it were Muslim and were not stopped by any other peaceable Muslim. The general media are still in denial, but at least a few journalists have hit the nail on the head, although even they are playing down immigration as a prime cause. It stands to reason. If Adi Bulajo and co's parents had not been let in to the UK, Lee would still be alive. And finally, a teapot that looks like Hitler. It's been reported in the Toronto Sun that J.C. Penney has officially denied that a tea kettle being advertised on a billboard on the 405 interstate near Culver City, California, is intended to represent Adolf Hitler, the Nazi dictator during the Second World War. This presenter says, I'm sorry, but it does. The way it's pictured on the poster with the kettle handle resembling the famous hairdo and quiff with the moustache as the handle of the lid and the body of the kettle and all on a huge billboard straddling the interstate 
Lovely. And to add insult to injury, the spout of the kettle has a bell at the end and looks like the fascist salute. It's marvellous. But then, as one of my cat looks like Hitler with a moustache and the character to match, you know, Poland today, tomorrow's the world, no problem for me. The company was forced to issue a statement denying the company purposefully fashioned a teapot that resembled Hitler. Using their Twitter account, J.C. Penny responded to multiple queries about the teapot. Wonder where they came from. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I'm Lynn Mozart. I wish you all a very good night.